In early September 1939, British Movie Tone News informed an anxious nation in cinemas all over the country that Britain was again at war. The fateful hour of 11 has struck and Britain's final warning to Hitler having been ignored, a state of war once more exists between Great Britain and Germany. I was uh, frightened, not knowing quite what to expect, really. It was quite a traumatic time, but there are many, many instances in war where one feels, well, if your number's up, you get in. We had many, many escapes. We were all pretty well terrified. I was terrified. One of my very close pals in the fire service uh, was killed with possibly the first bomb that fell on West Ham. During the Second World War, most of these people served in home front occupations. The home front consisted of millions of volunteers who augmented the fire brigades, police, the casualty services, rescue, anti-aircraft, the air raid proportion service, the women's voluntary service and the home guard. This is their story. The build-up to a possible world war started as far back as 1935 when the German Führer Adolf Hitler announced that Germany had re-established her military air force named the Luftwaffe and introduced military conscription. Both of these acts were in direct contravention of the Versailles Treaty signed after the first war in 1919 which forbade Germany to produce any armaments or to enlarge its small home defense army and navy. In July 1936, a civil war started in Spain with the right-wing Spanish military against the left-wing Republican government. It wasn't long before the fascist governments of Germany and Italy sent in so-called volunteers, guns and aircraft. The civil war proved an ideal testing ground for Hitler's new Luftwaffe who helped to blitz the major Spanish cities. They tried out their planes on Spain, you see, helping the, the rebels from Franco against the legal government. And Guernica, oh, that was a terrible thing, Guernica, flattened it. These images on Britain's cinema screens, which were the only visual evidence to the British public, were so real that the civilian population became very concerned that the same thing might easily happen to their street, town or city. The awful spectacle of Spanish civilians forced to hide in hastily built air raid shelters as their cities went up in flames under carpets of German bombs created alarm all over the world. The fear was that what had happened in Spain could also happen in Britain. The British government estimated that 120,000 civilians would be killed in the first week of a future war. Because one of the greatest fears was that poison gas would be dropped from the air. The war gases were simply horrible. Horrible. Many ex-servicemen remembered the appalling gas attacks in the trenches during the first war and the terrible legacy it left its victims. Germany invents air raids, a nightmare legacy for all mankind. I was given special training in the various war gases and it was thought at that time that um, it was um, very, very likely that the Germans would use poison gas in the early stages. 
For this reason, the British government, headed by Neville Chamberlain, instigated the manufacture of gas masks, or respirators, to be distributed to the entire population. Because it was believed that if war was to come, then it would be from the air, as in Spain. In January 1937, his government went one stage further and appealed for volunteers to be air raid wardens. As members of the Air Raid Precaution Service, or ARP, their job in peacetime was to advise the public in recommended air raid precautions. There were rehearsals. Around the Thames estuary and along the Medway, lights have gone out and the first large-scale rehearsals of air raid precautions are staged in England. Grotesquely clad wardens and ambulance men dash to and fro, giving help and guidance and rescuing mock casualties. When a year ago, British Movie Tone News, through its editor, urged the necessity of educating the civilian population to operations of this kind, it was like a voice crying in the wilderness. Now it has come to pass. Well, the seriousness being realised, let's see the humour of it. By the light of day, the ambulance helpers practise their craft, but some of the victims have enough life left in them to be awkward. There is anti-air raid training for the army, too. Sorry, Annie, sorry at all. Then forward the rescue party and the fire brigade as smoke begins to pour from one section of Wellington barracks. Injured guardsmen are carried out on stretchers, and finally an incendiary bomb is located and removed in a general service bucket. Next comes the decontamination squad, hosing the mustard gas into a gully. Amid the grimness of it all, let's have one laugh and admire the realistic acting of a melodramatic sentry. Because of the threat of gas, Under Secretary for Home Affairs, Geoffrey Lloyd, campaigned for people to stay in their homes in the event of war. He viewed a gas-proofed house, which was surrounded by chlorine gas, to see the effects for himself. Well, sir, did you smell any gas while you were in there? No, I didn't smell a whiff. And that shows the value of gas-proofing a room. And after all, it can all be done with household accessories, costing only a few pence. How the conflict began is a story imprinted in documents for all time. But here it is in pictures. Remember Munich? On September the 29th, 1938, Germany, Italy, France and Britain compelled Czechoslovakia to give back Sudetenland to Germany. In return, Chamberlain was convinced that he had achieved peace for Britain. When he returned with the Anglo-German agreement, it did seem that there was a chance of peace, if Hitler was sincere. We were disarming. And I think that must, must have been the reason why our Prime Minister, uh, Neville Chamberlain, uh, decided on his business of appeasement because he appreciated that the, um, the great strength of the German Army, Navy and Air Force, particularly the Air Force, we'd had a pretty good demonstration of what their German Air Force could do in the uh, Spanish Civil War with the raids on um, Spanish cities with uh, Guernica in particular, uh, that um, the alarm bells began to ring in this country. Volunteers are coming forward, equipment is being provided, and Britain is at last awakening to the drastic need for air raid preparedness. Recent events on the continent have made us all think furiously, and we now realise that we are faced with new conditions of warfare. So what Sir Samuel Hoare has to tell us is of particular importance. I appeal for a million men and women to help us with our work. I've had a splendid response. We are going to get our million, but I want all you to come in and give in your names to help us in this great job. At Westminster, where volunteers are learning the work of decontamination. There are, of course, other aspects of anti-aircraft work in which there is a call for volunteers. At the Mansion House London, an anti-aircraft gun is on show and the appeal for territorial recruits for the anti-aircraft divisions finds a quick response amongst city men. But don't let us be satisfied with these pictures of the other fellow coming forward. We have had a shock, 
but it is so easy to slip back into a sense of false security as the reaction to a shock. So here's a Samuel Hoare again. Come along to help us to make your country and your homes as safe as we can make them. Is this preview of London's balloon barrage? Another form of defense against the threat from the air was the barrage balloon. Laying above the clouds at 25,000 feet, the balloons will force radars up to heights where accuracy and bombing will be difficult. They will act as a wall over which aeroplanes must climb or become entangled in the cables. Meanwhile, on the ground, one countermeasure against the bombing was the Anderson Shelter, which had been designed by Dr. David Anderson it would sustain almost anything but a direct hit. Fourteen sheets of corrugated iron six feet high, four and a half feet wide and six and a half feet long formed a strong shell, which was buried to a depth of four feet and covered with at least 15 inches of soil. The shelter could accommodate up to six people in dank discomfort because it was liable to frequent flooding. Seventy shillings will construct a garden dugout, that is, providing you build it yourself. At the warning of Mrs. Matthews, the children scamper for the shelter, which was designed by her husband so as not to spoil the look of the property. It can be proofed against gas and will afford protection against everything but a direct hit. Cost, elephant iron sheet for roof, a pound, timber corner posts and cross pieces, a pound, wood lining for walls, ten shillings, three bags of cement, a pound, earth or sand free, and the brickwork is a luxury. An emergency exit is provided, and the children use it in normal times as a playshed. For the time being, war is very much a present evil, and it has become inevitable, even in peaceful democracies, to accustom children to the use of gas masks. How long ago is it since a picture like this would have been either abhorred or ridiculed? But today, the education of small children in methods of self-preservation is recognized as a humane proceeding. Though war will probably not come over Czechoslovakia, it still remains a ghastly spectre on the international horizon. Well, I just remember mine. Um, I don't remember having to put it on other than the test, but it was the standard Mickey Mouse gas mask, a little red thing, and we were tested for them. And uh, we never liked wearing them, of course, but they were restricted. Pretty awful, because it was this sort of box, like a cardboard box. Um, that we had to carry around, and uh, it was a bit claustrophobic, you know, not very nice. But it wasn't all gloom and doom in 1938, as gas masks and decontamination suits could be worn on special occasions. The latest in uniforms for wedding ceremonies are, of course, decontamination suits. It had to happen, I suppose. Crossed shovels form an arch for this ingenious pair of lovebirds undertaking the first hazard of matrimony. You may think air raid precautions rather a grim subject for lightheartedness, but it's a British characteristic to laugh at trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Clements of Gillingham start married life with a good blowing up and go off to their honeymoon in a gas school omnibus. In spite of Hitler's assurances, he was still hell-bent on invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. Herr Hitler's demands for Sudetenland have been met by British and French intercession, but he is not content to gain them by agreement he feels he must force them home by immediate occupation of the area. But at this moment, I see nothing further that I can usefully do in the way of mediation. Those are the words of Mr. Chamberlain. Unwilling to abandon hope, the Prime Minister sent Sir Horace Wilson to Hitler with a personal letter for the German Chancellor. Desperately, he worked to prevent catastrophe, acting with the support and agreement of his cabinet colleagues and driving frequently to Buckingham Palace to consult the King. Meanwhile, the new order of things had been accepted by Britain's teeming millions. Notices appeared urging men, women and children to attend at certain addresses to have gas masks fitted. You and I, who responded to this request, found ARP volunteers administering to our needs with an efficiency as obliging as the barbers and gentler than the dentists. Over the head. Thank you. Now that's your fitting, a medium type of respirator. Would you mind taking it off from the back, over the head? Thank you. Millions of gas masks had been concentrated in city depots, and even while the fitting was still proceeding, there came the order to distribute them. So, the gas mask comes into our lives. It has been a grim year. 1938 will not be very gratefully remembered. Or the triumphs of Hitler, his annexation of Austria, the crushing of Czechoslovakia. It has been a year of crises, and we can hardly ignore them. 
but it has also been the year of the Lambeth Walk, and we may be grateful to Lupino Lane and the other pioneers of that dance phenomenon which has helped to preserve our sense of value. For even gas masks and ARP have been unable to still that undaunted OI! Agree with his policy or not, there is little doubt that dramatic events made the British Prime Minister the outstanding figure of the year. Chamberlain came back with this piece of paper and we, we were happy that it was going to be no war, though we were sorry for Czechoslovakia and all that, but what we realised afterwards, it could have been stopped before if we'd have been firmer. And it seems clear that we have run into a fresh era of history when the civilian's home once more becomes his castle. Therefore, amid trenches, dugouts and refuges, respirators and decontamination suits, yes, and ARP kennels and ARP prams, let Movie Tone express the wish that somewhere, by the grace of Providence, you may find prosperity, plenty and peace in 1939. Early in 1939, the first of the Anderson shelters were delivered. They're unloaded from the stations for delivery to householders with incomes under 250 a year. Above that limit, householders may buy them. Our old friend the horse van helps to distribute them. Unemployed men will help to erect them. Meanwhile, the call to national service has gone forth. The postman is delivering the handbook at your door, and perhaps you're standing there wondering what you can do. Well, if you're a young man, you can join the Air Force. The aeroplane has revolutionized warfare as surely as the invention of gunpowder changed it in the Middle Ages. It's in the air that countries need young men today. In one unit or another, you can get trained while keeping your civilian employment. It's all in the handbook. If you're an older man, you can become an anti-aircraft gunner, or you can join a balloon squadron and help to force raiders up to heights where precision bombing of cities is impossible. If you're a woman, you can join the Auxiliary Territorial Service and undertake work which will relieve men in wartime for sterner tasks. And whether you are man or woman, employed or leisured, you can join the ARP or the Auxiliary Fire Service and learn how to protect yourself and save others from the worst effects of bombing raids. Early in 1939, fire services were authorised to start um, recruiting men and women um, to take part in the um, auxiliary fire service. And they were engaged and given a uniform, but not paid, uh, on the understanding that uh, should hostilities break out, they would come on full time and um, uh, would be required to um, serve as members of the fire service and the uh, rates of pay would be two pounds a week for women and three pounds a week for men. The core national service has gone forth. The country needs volunteers. I was called up and was working in London, the Ministry of Supply. Steel to the amount of tens of thousands of tons is being turned out for the various shelters which the Home Office has authorised for ARP. The furnaces are running full blast and these Cardiff works, the most up-to-date of their kind in Europe, have had the busiest week in their history. But here is a rather different type of shelter made of steel arches and sheets which were lying trenches dug in the parks during the crisis. Trenches are a sound method of protection from bombardment. Not only do they afford refuge, but being below ground reduce the shock of the explosion. Elsewhere, the work was put out to contractors, as in Charlton Park, or in London's one and only Hyde Park, which has been adapted to many strange purposes, but never one more sudden than this emergency. Many preferred the trenches dug in the parks. These shelters were more substantial than the Andersons. They were lined and roofed with either concrete or steel, but like the Andersons, they were liable to flooding. The greatest comfort was that they were completely buried three feet underground. So we had some air raid shelters, brick ones outside the back, out the back, and people would all go in then. My father had a reinforced building, it was a shelter, uh, added to the house. As a matter of fact, you can have a fortified kitchen if you like. The housewife enters, shakes her hair out after removing the gas mask, closes the airlock and gets down to the job of making the old man supper. If we've got to build a refuge room in every house, why not the kitchen? You keep your grub handy and safe from anything except a direct hit. During 1939, Britain had to think in terms of active defence against the aggressor. 
But first of all, look at the bomber, that engine of evil, messenger of mass murder. In the last event, we must have bombers to reply to bombing raids. But our object is defense, not aggression. So here follows a catalog of our defense needs. A passive defense, shelter in deep dugouts and trenches from the splinters and blast of high explosive bombs, protection from gas for even the youngest of us, firefighting appliances to extinguish the flames of incendiary bombs, broad highways for evacuation of surplus population from cities, and billets and camps in the country for the evacuated, particularly children. And for active defence, fighters, swift and numerous to intercept and engage the raiders, balloons to force them up to higher altitudes, anti-aircraft guns to hit or cripple them at their inhuman work. These are the various defences which Lord Chatfield must coordinate, but they all need men and women to man and run them. That's where national service comes in. Have we all answered the call to national service? So let's calculate the penetrating power of bombs. Then we can decide the value of the bomb deflector. Round balls of concrete, 15 or 18 inches in diameter, they are piled in pyramids above a trench or dugout. The test seems encouraging, we may hear more of them. And now let's see what protection the pepper pot type of shelter affords. 40 tons of good Birmingham wall went into that spectacle and the bulletproof, splinter-proof, shock-proof shelters have stood the test. Unfortunately, the Home Office did not consider them glamour-proof as well, for despite appearances, Miss Doreen Rickard was not inside during the experiment. The cumbersome anti-gas helmet for babies made its appearance in 1939. This fully tested outfit is demonstrated on a sturdy young spirit of Holborn who allows herself to be packed into the hood without protest. She looks through the non-inflammable window with a certain amount of amusement while her mother pumps in the air with a fitted bellows. Then, however, Maureen realises it's time for tea. But tears are soon passed and the parade of juvenile gas helmets finds all the occupants happy and sleepy. We did have gas masks for them, but we never used them now. We never used them. And the mother was expected, wearing her own respirator, to pump a bellows to pump air into the child's respirator in the event of, of gas. Uh, if you didn't wear your respirator, there was no doubt about it, if there was a gas attack and the gas would come in your way, it would prove fatal and very, very painful. In March 1939, Hitler tore up his Munich pledges and occupied the remainder of Czechoslovakia. In triumph, he surveyed his brave conquest from a high window in the castle of Prague. He abandoned all his cynical pretenses and exposed himself in all his duplicity. The turning point of British policy had come. A long-suffering government acted to preserve the independence of other menaced nations. Colonel Beck came to London and the British Pact was drawn up with Poland. Throughout the summer, Britain strove to build up a peace front with France as honourable ally. British negotiators went to Russia, but Ribbentrop also went to Russia and the vessel of peace was shipwrecked when he struck his grotesque bargain with Stalin. In response, First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, made an eloquent recruiting appeal at the Mansion House in London. Military weakness in this country encourages potential enemies. Anyone can see that public opinion is growing in favour of compulsory national service in all its forms and especially in the highest form. The question of conscription has been raised again and the government decides in view of the European situation that this tremendous departure from tradition must be taken. Suddenly, one morning, every poster in the streets bears the word, though varying ages are given, anticipating the introduction of the bill to call up men from 20 to 21. Well, I don't suppose there are many of them in any walk of life who are not perfectly ready to answer the call, for most people fully realise the vital necessity. The principle of compulsory service must prove to potential friends and enemies alike that Britain is in earnest, for it's a very big step for Britain to take to turn her young civilians into regular soldiers in peacetime. While these hours of destiny draw out, 
the citizen makes his preparations. Windows are darkened to render blackouts complete. Anderson shelters are stocked so that there may be nothing to think of at the last moment. The wise man carries buckets for water into his home as protection against the risk of incendiary bombs. First aid kit is assembled and gone over and gas masks are tested once again to make sure they're in good order. If your gas mask has deteriorated, you can get a new one. At St Pancras ARP office, they were busy fitting small kiddies with the masks for which they had been too young last year. And here's a picture which epitomizes the insanity of this appalling chapter of history, a child in a gas mask. However, not to finish on too grim a note, here's a typical conversation we overheard. Ah, good morning. Morning. Do you think there's going to be a war? Damn. Not this week at any rate. It'll upset all the football pools. Yes, football carries on, and 40,000 see the Wolves oppose the Arsenal. The fans didn't have long to wait. After four minutes, Dorset marks up the first one to the home side. In spite of Britain's precarious position, much of life went on as usual. There was a grand national. The derby was run. Water speed records were broken. But the call for more volunteers on the home front continued, especially for stretcher bearers and first aid parties. We appeal also to women car drivers. If you can drive a car, you can be trained to drive a light ambulance. For both these vital services, men and women are asked to register with their local council. The need is urgent. Enroll now. I, I was, I'm an opt optimistic person and I just hoped that things would not come to, you know, war. In London streets, quietly and without fuss, preparedness is taking shape. Trenches are being dug around vital points. Earth is energetically shoveled into bags by willing hands and piled against key buildings. Institutions and business premises are being protected with the invaluable sandbag, which enjoys the most aristocratic form of transport to its destination. Evacuation rehearsal, that is, rehearsal of the assembly of children for an evacuation, went off smoothly in the elementary schools. The youngsters turned up unconcernedly and took the proceedings in their stride. Carrying gas masks and their names on a label, they filed out to the railway stations from which they would entrain on the declaration of hostilities. Beyond that point, the rehearsal could not be pressed without disorganizing the railway services. By the middle of 1939, it was clear that Hitler was looking to Poland as his next victim. In Britain, public opinion hardened against his aggression. Vile, what a tyrant, absolute tyrant Hitler was, you know. He, he double-crossing swine, wasn't he? But Britain is prepared, ready to shoulder her responsibilities and face every peril which may be forthcoming. The personnel of the Defence Forces has increased rapidly in the face of danger. The anti-aircraft units, efficient and magnificently organised, inspire that utmost confidence which we know to exist in these isles. Returning to the civilian aspect of these feverish days, here is a poignant comment on the times in which we live. Invalids, young and old, many of them helpless, are transferred from their hospitals to places of greater safety. At any rate, evacuation is carried out with maximum speed and minimum discomfort. The efficiency with which these schemes of evacuation have been planned and executed is a consoling thought and a matter of congratulation to the organizers. The departure of the children, in particular, has been a triumph of orderly precision. From cities and towns, children in their thousands have left their parents behind and been drafted off to safety zone. We, uh, we had a notice from the school saying that the children were being evacuated. And so we were told, um, we were given a list of articles they were to take, uh, a small case with a change of underclothes, uh, spare socks, underwear, 
a raincoat, a top coat, plus their gas mask, which they wore around their neck. And here, another consoling thought, most of the children themselves have gone off cheerfully enough. For them, fortunately, the whole procedure seems to hold no terrors and is even regarded as just another holiday. The last we saw of our kids, we gave them a last kiss and a hug. And there were lots of tears flowing among the parents and the children. And off went the train, carrying the children into the unknown. And that's the last we saw of them. We went back home and uh, we sat in the empty house looking at each other, wondering if we'd done the right thing. With food and clothing provided by their parents and each carrying a gas mask, they entrain for their excitingly unknown destination. I was about seven years of age at the time. Um, I can remember you know, going to the main line station and palling up with a chap who was about four years older than I was, a chap called Brian Stringer from Bat Battersea. And I don't think my mother was too pleased at the time, but we actually finished up being billeted together in a farmhouse in Dolphin Home in Lancashire. How long will they be away? How long before they again live beneath the same roof with their parents? How is it possible for them to understand that the routine of their daily lives has been shattered by one man hundreds of miles away in a country they have never seen? That it has been brought about by what Mr. Chamberlain has described as the senseless ambition of this one man? We spent six and a half months together on the farm, I say near to Dolphin Home, just about two miles outside, near a little tiny, tiny hamlet called um, is it Bay Horse. But I had a really great time. Actually, I can remember at that time being very good on the farm. I enjoyed it because I, I had a love of animals. Obviously, it was picked up. I was homesick and I was fretting, even though I was enjoying the farm. And I had missed my mother um, dreadfully. In spite of Chamberlain's appeasement of Hitler, the stakes were raised yet again because in September 1939, German and Russian forces started their invasion of Poland. We're wondering whether, whether it would actually come to a war, but then of course we heard Neville Chamberlain who realised that uh, the, uh, the German promises were of no value at all. Um, uh, decided that he would uh, carry out his obligations to Poland and that if Germany invaded Poland then Britain would be at war with Germany. After a final warning to Hitler which was ignored, Britain and France declared war on Germany at 11 o'clock on September the 3rd, 1939. The state of war once more exists between Great Britain and Germany. For it is evil things that we shall be fighting against. Brute force, bad faith, injustice, oppression and persecution. Only 25 minutes after war had been declared came the first air raid warning. For obvious reasons we have cut out the sound of the sirens. We were in um, Brixham on holiday and um, my father said oh, we'd better go home early because it was the end of August. He thought something was happening. So we came home and of course on the Sunday, the, at 11 o'clock I think it was, the 3rd of September, war was declared and we went in the garden and put on our gas masks and um, just didn't know quite what was going to happen next, you know, just waiting. This was an opportunity for the people of Britain to demonstrate their traditional calm in the face of danger. There was no sign of panic. Men and women in the streets made their way quickly to the nearest shelter and queued up in orderly processions at the entrances. First warning, we all took shelter and some of the elderly people come down with their gas masks on, you see. Although the alarm proved to be a false one, it was of great benefit as a full dress rehearsal and a swift reminder of what war now means to the civilian. Unhappy about it, very unhappy. 
because we didn't, if uh, we'd, we'd have been unhappier still if we'd known what was coming. On the whole, Britain takes the declaration of war quietly enough, but in places, the cheerful readiness of the nation to face these new facts is made evident. Already, Cockney humour is adjusting its wit to the new condition. On the other hand, grim evidence that the nation is in earnest can be seen in every street. Meanwhile, here's the last picture of Herr Kort, the German charge d'affaires, as he leaves the embassy and drives away en route for Berlin. For many of these people, it's a case of going to the office now and performing ARP duty later on in the day. Soon, the whole country will be absorbed in its own defence, but by no means the least important aspect of this is the everyday work of the nation. One day I was selling flags at, at 8 o'clock in the morning at Serbton Station for the Red Cross, having been up half the night and at this canteen and all the rest of it. And a man came along and said, haven't you got anything better to do? <laughs> Which rather upset me. <laughs> well, I suppose he just thought that's all I was going to do that day. It would take more than a war to stop the Premier and his wife from enjoying their morning walk. London's precautions against enemy air raids grow more thorough every day, and strong points like this inspire increasing confidence. Fashions in gas mask containers are topical. Compare what the smart waitress is now wearing with the popular cardboard model favoured by most customers. I used to have lunch in Fuller's in the Strand and we all had to get under our tables when the, <laughs> the siren went. And then there are fashions in window papering. An infinite variety of patterns has already appeared. Sandbags, of course, are everywhere. Protect protect anybody in London. Prince Monolulu has evidently adapted himself to the new conditions. He would. I give you a gas mask. Are we afraid of Hitler? No! no. Are we don't hurt him? No! The home front, one of the really staggering sights at the moment is the variety of signs on windscreens. There seems no limit to the reasons why each car should have priority over every other. Here's one of the best reasons yet evolved. Some signs can be most misleading. Our lamps on our bikes were very dim. You couldn't see much. In the blackout, a dark night, you couldn't see anything. I was going along happily to work, and all of a sudden I was on the floor. I hit a bloke walking in the road. And the silly son, so I turned around to me and said, look where you're going. Ah, oh, dear me, we nearly had a fight in the middle of the road. We wouldn't have been out to see one, though, anyway. All headlamps were reduced to slits of light during the blackout, and petrol was in short supply. This meant that... Gadgets of the last war emerge as the rigours of the present conflict increase. Things are bad indeed when the old gas bag is resurrected to supply the motive power beneath your bonnet. I have to mention one of the good points of this antique invention, you can smoke without fear of touching off the gas. The bag contains the equivalent of one and two-third gallons of petrol, and if you wanted to drive 50 miles or so, they'd have to heighten the bridges for you. In order to economize Even the, the bigger petrol, buses and lorries had to make their own fuel to save petrol. Gas is produced by means of anthracite in a special trailer towed by the lorry or bus. And the Minister of Mines, Mr. Geoffrey Lloyd, is very interested in examining the various types on show. It's an ingenious plan, and we shall no doubt grow accustomed to seeing buses like this. At the back of us in King George's Park, they had a whole series of balloons, these um, balloons that they used to put up against aircraft. And one night, uh, one of them half deflated, 
and was blowing about in the wind, flapping like mad, and it frightened the life out of us. The balloon, in a gallant bid for freedom, nearly succeeded in getting away, but not quite. Even in circles as efficient as a balloon barrage unit, accidents will occur on rare occasions, and this is one of them. The attempted arrest of the balloon responsible for all the trouble. Cats, I don't hit a balloon when it's down. The last act is the death of the balloon. All rather sad, don't you think? After the um, outbreak of war, war had been declared, um, we never knew that the Germans may not be uh, sending their air force over to raid us the very next day. But it so turned out that it was just on 12 months before the uh, first of the German raiders came over this country. And um, so we were given that period, which the Americans christened the phony war, because there was no action taking place. It was a strange period, the phony war. It was, you know, sort of living on a knife edge, really wondering what was going to happen next. In December 1939, Winston Churchill broadcast to the country on BBC Radio. We tried again and again to prevent this war. And for the sake of peace, we put up with a lot of things happening which ought not to have happened. But now we are at war. And we are going to make war. And persevere in making war until the other side have had enough of it. We have been uh, agreeably surprised that 10 weeks have been allotted to us to get into fighting crim. We are in a very different position from that we were in 10 weeks ago. We are far stronger than we were 10 weeks ago. We are far better prepared to endure the worst malice of Hitler and his Huns than we were at the beginning of September. But this I will say, without a doubt, that the fate of Holland and Belgium, like that of Poland, Czechoslovakia and Austria, will be decided by the victory of the British Empire and the French Republic. Now, I was appointed um, as uh, an instructor to the Auxiliary Fire Service. We took these lads on. They went through a modified version of the same sort of training that I'd gone through as a professional fireman in 1925. Climbing ladders, working pumps, running out fire hose, handling branches. That's what you, or the older public, would call a nozzle in the fire service. That's known as the branch. Christmas 1939 saw thousands of parents leaving to visit their evacuated children. Families once happily united have been scattered by the war. But here's the first big organized visit of reunion, and the parents are naturally taking a lot of presents with them. The joys of the country are much appreciated by most of the evacuees, but village shops have their limitations. And when they arrive, what a reunion. Many of these divided families haven't seen each other since the war began, so now they have a really wonderful time. My wife said, uh, oh, well, I'm going down to see them. And she um, got on the coach in Ilford High Street and um, went down to Radford-on-Avon and stayed with the children. She rang me up and told me we were there. So I said, will you stay for a couple of days and get them more or less... Um, bedded in, as it were, and um, I went back on duty. Touring reception centres for evacuated children, the Queen is given a very hearty welcome at Chichester. 
At the assembly rooms, nearly 200 children from South London troop in to have lunch. The Queen herself samples the threepenny meal and declares it very good. Her Majesty spends many hours talking with members of the Women's Voluntary Services, all of whom are doing such excellent work. The Duchess of Norfolk is a leader of the WVS in this district. So ended 1939. It was to the echo of marching feet that a new decade was ushered in. And the picture? The picture is of a nation rapidly, but nonetheless surely, mobilizing its manhood for the supreme trial, mobilizing its manhood for the supreme cause, liberty and the defeat of aggression. Manhood includes womanhood. Nothing has been more impressive in these early days of war than the part undertaken by women. War has at all times called for the fortitude of women. Even in other days, when it was an affair of the fighting forces only, wives and mothers at home suffered constant anxiety for their dear ones and, too often, the misery of bereavement. Their lot was all the harder because they felt they could do so little beyond heartening through their own courage and devotion the men at the front. Now this is all changed, for we, no less than men, have real and vital work to do. To us also is given the proud privilege of serving our country in her hour of need. Those were the Queen's words broadcast to the nation. 1939 has become the first year of the Second World War. Certainly it has been a war such as no man could have predicted. Taught by the Great War and German propaganda to expect a fierce blitzkrieg, we have stood ready for the assault on our cities. The British Expeditionary Force has taken its place beside the armies of France to confront the German military machine. Neither of these two arms of our defence has yet been seriously engaged. Well, we did sort of manoeuvres and went down to Bisley and practiced firing. We, we, got, we could fire rifles all right, we got pretty good. It was quiet on the home front. The cinema, and movie tone in particular, continued to pump out advice. What to do in an air raid? Here are a few important rules to remember. Get under cover at once. Don't stand staring at the sky, take cover at once. But don't rush, take cover quietly, then others will do the same. If you're in the open with no cover, lie down. If your home is within five minutes, go there and take shelter. And keep away from windows. Admit passers-by, they need shelter too. Motorist, get off the main road, park close to the curb. Switch off headlamps, leave only side and rear lamps. Always carry your gas mask. See that your blackout is complete. Above all, don't stand staring at the sky. Take cover. The fire service was a public body, was ready to go to anyone's assistance, uh, whatever the problem. Horse fallen down a basement, a cat gone up a tree. We even had a little boy climbed up onto the seat uh, of the toilet. Uh, to see what the noise was coming from the cistern above. And he slipped and his foot jammed down in the pan of the lavatory. His mother tried vainly to pull his foot out and she went outside to pick up a man in the street who said, um, have you got a hammer? And she said, what are you going to do? He said, well, break the pan, get the boy's foot out. No, you don't, she said. I'm going to send for the fire service. 
So she ran around the fire station and she called the firemen out. And the fire service has been used for many years to respond to these little domestic problems. And so the station officer, a man of considerable experience, just uh, put his hand down, unlaced the boy's shoe, took his foot out of the shoe, and then retrieved the shoe afterwards, and the lavatory pan was safe. In France, the French army manned the Maginot Line and waited. Impatient by nature, the Frenchman persuaded himself that Hitler never meant to attack. Said Hitler, the French army rutted on its feet. That may or may not be true. Then suddenly on April the 10th, the first blow was struck. Hitler occupied Denmark and invaded Norway. The Scandinavian countries who had made a creed of neutrality found themselves overrun by the Nazi aggressor without even a declaration of war. The short war in Norway led to the fall of Mr. Chamberlain. On May the 10th, 1940, Winston Churchill became Britain's Prime Minister and formed an all-party coalition government. It was clear that Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement to Germany had been a complete disaster. Britain was at war and the war was not going well. The British needed strong leadership. They hoped they'd got it in the old warrior Winston Churchill. The Labour Party refused to work under Chamberlain, who was forced to resign, but remained at the Churchill right hand. Labour leader Clement Attlee became Deputy Prime Minister. Behind every appointment will be the personality of Mr Churchill, inspiring, stimulating, driving. Oh, he's great. <laughs> he was great. This is an incendiary bomb. It takes fire on impact and may burn 15 minutes. It will ignite anything in its vicinity. The stirrup hand pump is the best to deal with both bomb and fire. The barrel is placed in a bucket while another person runs out the hose. The nozzle can be adjusted to give a jet for use on the fire or a spray for use on the bomb itself. When using the jet, pump at 65 double strokes a minute, 35 for the spray. Keep low to attack the fire, there's less heat and smoke. The Browns at home. Suddenly an alarm, enemy aircraft are here, but the Browns are prepared to tackle the worst. An incendiary bomb hits the house. It burns very violently for the first minute, but after that it can be tackled. Brown goes to ascertain the damage and sends to Smith's next door for the pump they share. There's no panic. A bucket, always kept full, is placed outside the front door Miss Smith arrives. She has received training from the local authorities, which you too can receive. Brown decides to operate the pump away from the heat and smoke. You'll notice how Miss Smith keeps as near the floor as possible and plays a jet of water on the heart of the fire to get it under control. Brown Jr. calls the fire brigade just in case. While the spray is on the bomb, the surroundings are kept wet and the bomb is doing no more damage. You'll notice Miss Smith is alternately using jet and spray. Three or four families can club together to share the cost of a pump. They can apply to the local authorities for training. Now the spray has done its work, the bomb is almost out. Miss Smith finishes off the job. By being thus equipped to deal with the emergency, these people have saved their houses and perhaps their lives. You can do the same. It's up to you. In May 1940, the war hotted up across the Channel when Hitler's forces overran neutral Holland in less than a week. Both the British and French armies were moved up into Belgium to stem the tide of the Nazi advance. It was not to be. The Germans struck at the hinge in the French line and created a bulge. The bulge became a gap employing the savage technique of indiscriminately blasting cities from the air they drove civilians before them to cause confusion in the allies lines they broke through to the channel coast and when king leopold of the belgians surrendered his army the bef was encircled the british expeditionary force had been pushed back to the french port of dunkirk there was no alternative but to mount the greatest evacuation in the history of warfare smoke from the fires of Dunkirk almost obscured the sun. But in this inferno, while the BEF and their French comrades held off the Nazis in an epic rearguard action, 
It was here that the yachts, motorboats and saucy Janes performed magnificent feats of rescue. Many were lost, sunk or blown to bits or burnt, but the gallant armada carried out the task assigned to it. In vessels of all sizes and descriptions, a third of a million men, including the wounded, were embarked and brought home under the protection of the Royal Navy. Under their own power or in tow, the amazing boats of Dunkirk crossed the channel with their valiant but exhausted passengers. Later, Londoners passing near the river saw the little ships arriving and gave them a cheer from the bridges. And at many places, the craft were tied up by the score, their emergency war work very well done. It took us a long time to get over Dunkirk. If the mercy of Dunkirk exceeded our remotest hopes, the collapse of France exceeded our wildest misgivings. Premier Renault was eased out of his position so that Marshal Pétain and General Végon might make terms with Hitler. The Parliament of the Third Republic met at Vichy to vote itself out of existence and the new French government signed an armistice with Germany. Only General de Gaulle and a remnant of gallant Frenchmen elected to carry on the struggle beside Britain. At this crisis in our history, when the possibility of invasion seemed very near, the Home Guard was born. A million and a half volunteers were enrolled to stand guard against parachutists and fifth columnists, while regular troops prepared to defend the beaches. I suppose we shall always remember the emotions of June and July this year, when it seemed that any day we might be assailed by the Nazi hordes and the soil of Britain become the new scene of conflict for our battalion. They um, asked us to join the Home Guard at, at the GC, Osram's it was called then, in Hammersmith, Osram's. So we all, nearly everybody joined the Home Guard, those who were able to. And um, time, of course, I got asked to join the night um, firebots, in which we did. Indeed, there is a new army drilling in our midst, the Broomstick Army. Squads of keen young patriots who have waited for months their turn to be called up and are now voluntarily drilling with broomsticks instead of weapons. From civilian veterans they learn the rudiments of drill and some large part of their training will be complete. All these things are signs of the will and eagerness of the individual to offer himself and herself in the country's service. It is ready and waiting to be employed. Have you joined the local defense volunteers? In this organization, you will find increasingly important work to do. You can carry on with your civil employment while discharging military duties. You can renew your acquaintance with firearms with all the self-confidence which the rifle gives you. Or if you're new to the rifle, you can quickly learn on the ranges how to handle and fire it. But you're taking your first pressure and you're going to apply the second pressure by gentle movement from the first finger. The LDVs at Bisley have been giving a good account of themselves. Then again, this organization contains a motorcycle contingent whose job will be very responsible if there is any breakdown in telephone communications. Do we put our cars out of action when leaving them? And have we digested the contents of the latest government pamphlet? Only if we can answer these questions with a yes, can we be considered citizens worthy of our country in its crisis. But I hate to think what would have happened if the Germans ever got over. We'd have, we'd, have, we'd have been slaughtered. Evacuated from London and the south of England, hundreds of dogs have adopted new owners for the duration. It's rather bad luck on the original owners, but that can't be helped. Many of the dogs will be given war work to do. They'll be taught by their new masters to help the LDV. Learning to handle a rifle is apparently part of their training. They should be good companions on patrol. Well, they'd, they'd come up with Tommy guns, etc., and cannons and artillery, if they could get over. So it was that during July 1940, Goering's Luftwaffe was given the task of destroying the RAF before Hitler could unleash his invasion of Britain, or Operation Sea Lion. The Battle of Britain had begun. The Luftwaffe tried to lure British fighters out over the channel by attacking British shipping, docks and even balloons. 
Not so easy as it looks. Those balloons are often at different heights, and they don't just go pop at the first bullet. Sometimes the Nazi pilot succeeds and a balloon falls flaming from the sky. But just as often, the Nazi pilot takes the count. Anti-aircraft guns force him up higher and higher, and then our fighters take a hand. In this and other battles along the English Channel, the Nazis have lost on one day 60 planes, on the next 62. There's one of them, a dive bomber, that will dive no more. British losses, though distressing, are much less. 16 on the day 60 Nazis were brought down. Dover Harbour is still there, and British ships still ply amid seas where Britannia still rules supreme. Oh, we saw, oh, we saw lots of dogfights, yes, yes. Saw lots of planes coming down. I know it wasn't very nice for the grown-ups, but for, the, for a young lad of 12 to 14 years of age, it was very exciting. In August 1940, Hitler and his chief of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering, switched their attacks to RAF airfields. Goering had promised Hitler that he would decimate the RAF in a matter of weeks. Fritz comes over looking very perky, but probably feeling quite the reverse, and heads inland. Then anti-aircraft batteries open up on him. And word is sent to those jaunty hurricane fighters who climb to meet him. The battle is fought above the clouds, but this is how it ends. One more of the 169. Another. And another. 169 in one day. The equivalent of 12 or 14 squadrons. How long can the Nazi Air Force stand such losses? which on August the 15th were in the ratio of 5 to 1. Yet you can see their problem. They must strike now before Britain's output of aircraft becomes overwhelming. We can view all this wreckage in the Prime Minister's phrase, not without relish. The Bosch got just what was coming to him, and on his own day. But inland, some German bombers did get through. Not all of us have yet been through an air raid, and the stories of those who have are still interesting. He has an account of how one ordinary citizen acted in the emergency and his conclusions. Last night, uh, about half past twelve, we had an air raid warning. We got down to our shelter and our neighbours, neighbour and his wife, came down with us. After what seemed to be a fairly short period, we thought we had no clear warning. We then uh, heard people about, so we go into the kitchen to make the usual cup of tea. Um, after some time, decided we'd better get to bed. We uh, go out into the garden, my friend and I, and looking about, I heard an aeroplane, we thought it was ours, and suddenly we saw a flash, and uh, heard a whining, whistling noise, like something falling. My friend turns to run to the air raid shelter, and he got sort of bumped into it. I turned to go into the house to see the wife and children, get them, and, uh, door open, down comes the scullery ceiling. I grabbed the little girl, the wife and baby, and went into the passage and laid down. After a few minutes, thought it uh, seemed a bit quieter, we get back into the air raid shelter, where we stayed until uh, some time later the official all-clear signal was given. Um, I must say, as I think anyone that ha has an Anderson shelter should see it's cleared out and run to it when they get the warning. And we may add, stay in it until the all-clear signal goes for certain. The lucky people these days are those who possess Anderson steel shelters. Make use of them and don't leave them until you really know it's all clear. One night a bomb did fall very close to us. We, it was only a hundred yards away and that was a, a direct hit on a house of people we knew and they were their Anderson shelter they were found at the end shot up to the end of the garden they, that was the end of them Meanwhile Hitler's Air Force continuing its raids on Britain has apparently decided that the city of London is a military objective High explosive and incendiary bombs were dropped here one fine night and many Londoners saw the glow from the fires that were started.
These were rapidly extinguished, and as you can see, the damage to property was not very extensive. But who would have thought that poor old Milton was a military objective? On September the 7th, 1940, Hitler changed his tactics and switched his bombers from RAF stations to a blitz of London. The Battle of London, which began with strong forces of Nazi bombers attacking the capital at night, led to a big fire on the waterside early in the onslaught. Londoners watching the blaze knew that Hitler and Goering now challenged them. The whole sky was red, looking across towards the docks. A big night attack like this was bound to do some industrial damage, but the majority of the German bombs, apparently unloaded at random, struck at civilians and private property. Many houses were demolished by these Nazi knights of the air, as their leader is pleased to call them, and street scenes like this illustrate the tragic story. Three hundred German bombers attacked the London docks. On the first day, more than 400 people were killed and 1,600 badly injured. The raiders claim to have used bombs of the heaviest caliber, and here's evidence that seems to confirm that statement. Their ridiculous claim to have damaged only military objectives is utterly contradicted by the facts. The attacks are evidently in the nature of terror raids, but the people of London are not to be intimidated by Nazi frightfulness. Suffering and sacrifice, these are inevitable, but the spirit of London remains indomitable. Look at this lot, searching for souvenirs. The civilians remain calm. Not all the tales of individual heroism by the civil defence forces will ever be told, but London thanks them with a special word of gratitude and admiration for the firefighters. Well, that's Saturday. Uh, the blitz broke on London and um, we were all pretty well terrified. Uh, we were a target, the bombs were dropping on the street. Um, one of my very close pals in the fire service uh, was killed with possibly the first bomb that fell on West Ham. Cyril had the distressing task of telling his friend's father the tragic news. And uh, I just had to tell him what had happened. And the old man broke down. And I wasn't very far from it myself. With the shock of everything that was going on. Craters in the streets, gas mains alight with flames roaring up. Water squirting up from fractured water mains. Tangled telephone wires and electric cables. And... Um, he said, where is he? I said, I, 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 I can't tell you that. And um, off he went. That's how it continued. The King was one of the first to visit the badly hit localities where he met and congratulated ARP workers. All his people know full well that his sympathy is heartfelt. Typifying the resolution displayed throughout the kingdom, the capital stands defiant. The Battle of London, grim as it is, will be won by London. Every night after that, we were um, being raided from um, um, uh, early evening until um, it got light in the morning, till dawn broke. The latest outrage of the Nazis' indiscriminate fury is the bombing of Buckingham Palace. While missiles were raining down on London, as they've already rained upon many other of our towns, a time bomb fell only a few feet from the wall of the palace at the back. The King and Queen, who were absent when it exploded, soon returned to the spot and examined the damage, which was fairly heavy. The swimming pool was smashed, masonry had been hurled about, and much glass broken. Later, the palace was bombed again, but the King and Queen, who on this occasion were present, escaped mercifully unharmed. Their majesties have continued to tour the districts that have suffered most damage in recent raids, and the knowledge that their king and queen are among them, they were actually caught in a raid and had to take shelter during this particular visit, has greatly heartened the people. Their majesties were tremendously impressed by their steady courage. Meanwhile, Hitler's rage grows more furious, and his bombers continue to strike in many parts of London, as well as other cities and towns. I admired them, I always have admired the royal family.
They went down the East End and we were sort of happy that they did, showed themselves down there. Bombs have fallen in the very centre of the capital, within a few hundred yards of Piccadilly Circus. The Nazi assault may well be a prelude to invasion, but in that event we shall simply stay put, as we have been told, while the enemy is dealt with by the services. A terrific anti-aircraft barrage has been organised to defend the capital. Nazi planes continue to be shot down by the score, and our own bombers are hitting back good and hard as the Battle of Britain reaches a climax. At this crisis in world history, the words of our Premier are an inspiration. I express my admiration for the exemplary manner in which all the air raid precaution services of London are being discharged, especially the fire brigades whose work has been so heavy and uh, also dangerous. All the world that is still free marvels at the composure and fortitude with which the citizens of London are facing and surmounting the great ordeal to which they are subjected, the end of which, or the severity of which, cannot yet be foreseen. To endure bombing for 57 consecutive nights during the autumn and winter of 1940, culminating in the um, uh, Great City Blitz on the 29th, the night of the 29th of December 1940, uh, when they had a concerted attack on the city of London, and uh, they set out to destroy the financial city of London, and they very nearly succeeded. The air raid started around five, so for six hours we were subjected to bombing, uh, which um, coincided with a, an abnormally low tide on the Thames. Um, of course, in the early stages of the air raid, uh, the Germans dropped their high explosive bombs, which had the effect of um, uh, fracturing the water mains, which in any event were quite inadequate to provide the water uh, that was required. Um, with the abnormally low tide of the Thames on that particular evening, and um, we, um, it was very difficult. The fire boats lay down in the centre of the stream, uh, yards from the shore, and the fire crews had to wade ashore through thick mud on the surface of the river, uh, on the bed of the river, to um, bring their hose ashore and pump water for firefighting. Well, during the night the tide came in and uh, we were able to get pumps to work from the banks of the Thames, but altogether it was a dreadful night and that was the night that uh, St Paul's Cathedral came closest to destruction. And here's another typical target selected by Marshal Goering for his brave bombers, St Paul's Cathedral. Terrorism and vandalism go hand in hand and the Nazis are highly skilled in both. They dropped a delayed action bomb said to weigh a tonne in Dean's yard but the skill of the men of a bomb disposal section saved Wren's great masterpiece on that occasion at least. They had to dig deep down to get at the bomb, then they had to haul it out and drive away with it on a perilous dash through the capital. The work of our bomb disposal units both here and on less spectacular sites is beyond praise. And that goes for all the ARP services. Here's a warden whose own house, as you can see, caught it properly. Well, I was standing in this doorway when the bomb dropped. I made to go inside, I couldn't get inside. My dad was in the front room, so I had to get him out through the front room window. I got him out and I went to the back and got other people out and see that they were safe in the Anderson shelters. Then I returned onto the patrol on duty. As for the Anderson shelter, that continues to prove itself everywhere. This interview, by the way, was completed as the banshee howled again. You can hear it wailing on the screen. We were in the dugout, and thanks to the dug, thanks to the Anderson shelter, we we're quite safe. I think he dropped a couple of bombs on us, and it shook the Anderson shelter like very ill. But uh, when I heard the four boys talk to me, I was quite contented. So far, I was thankful. The East End was having it badly. We knew that. We could see by the fires. We were on the stairs actually, and. Um, there are concrete stairs and iron railings, iron banisters, very well built. The building shook. Some, some people were very scared. I was scared too. The people suffered terribly. And uh, some of them said, we can't go on. 
but um, well, I just had to. And there was a body found on missing, and they found it on top of the West London Cinema, what was left of him. During those trying days in 1940, the home front services had proved invaluable to a nation subjected to Hitler's onslaught, especially during the Battle of London when... Wave after wave of German bombers crossed the few miles of channel to rain daylight havoc on the capital. Our Spitfires and Hurricanes broke them up and smashed them down. Goering had miscalculated the strength of the RAF. As Mr. Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. And the exploits of the Royal Air Force in September 1940 will ring down the ages. Of course, London suffered, and the night attacks which followed the failure of the daylight raids have added to the havoc. But the indomitable spirit of the Londoner has surmounted all that. The same is true of Merseyside and of other centres on which Hitler has concentrated his hate, including Coventry. This substantial industrial city was selected for a special blitzkrieg of its own. The spite of the enemy thwarted over London was visited indiscriminately on a smaller community. If we look forward to the turn of the tide in 1941, as indeed we do, it is because we have confidence in ourselves, our men and our leadership. So roll on 1941!